Alright, Swash Hammer, I'm guessing you've all heard of the Swash Hammer Wreck at some point, because I tend to give a lot of talks about it in the past. Okay, so I'm Grant, and I've been lucky enough to work on it to completion, from the whole of the excavation all the way through to display now. So I started as a student and got involved with the Swash in around 2012, and then worked on it ever since, pretty much on and off for in intermittent periods. So, I'll give you a kind of walkthrough of what we've done since excavation, and then I'll kind of go on the tangents, and there's a lot of tangents for this from the 3D data and how rich that is. Okay. Oh, so, the size of the 7 to 10 metres, and it's wrecked on the approaches to pool. It's calculated as a 1630s estimate from the various finds found off of it. Uh, and it's now newly identified as the fame, which sunk in 1631. So we were bang on, pretty much. The Dengo, the Dengo is done by N Nigel Nalen. He gave us a 1628 date. And it was proven to be Northwest European timbers, mainly oak. So obviously we had, we're tending towards the Dutch built theory at that point. And then once we had the identification of the fame, which has been known about for quite a long time, we didn't mention it until the unveiling of the rudder recently. So, the site consists of 8% of the port side, and it looks like, oh, that's not it. <coughs> All right, so a brief history of the site. So it's originally located in 1990, just to show the kind of longevity of this site. I'm born in 1991. So 1990 is when this site is found. <laughs> so just to kind of give you how long, how long this has gone. 2004, 2005, Wessex did an initial survey of the site, refound it with side scan, and then did, did various survey work. 2006, 2009, Bournemouth University monitored the site and kind of noticed varying levels of erosion coming out. That was Kev just sat up there when he was a student. Again, just kind of gets how long this project's been going on for. No offence. <laughs> but um, yeah. So 2006, 2009, various monitoring rods were placed around the, around the site. Kind of just monitor the sediment levels and what's being eroded out. From that, it was noticed that loads of sediments being moved and it's coming out at a vast rate. So various bits, mainly the bow castles and areas like that, were coming out in vast quantities, finds are being lost. Around a metre a year, I believe, is one of the estimates of how much sediment's being lost. So then a rescue excavation was started by Bournemouth University, 2010. 2012. This is when I first started as an uh, undergraduate. So I started as an undergraduate there in 2011 and picked up the last end of the excavation. And that at the time was the largest excavation seen since the Mary Rose. So it was massive and it was not a student-led project but heavy student involvement. Heavy amounts of student divers and Bournemouth University marching was all done by students as well as part of that. And then from the excavation, the rescue excavation, there was the recovery of the timbers in 2013, 2014, the recording of the timbers, 2015 16, it was kind of a year over that period, uh, the analysing of the timbers, and eventual final publication, that should be soon, we hope, if we can get it, get it together. So, this is it. So as you can see, it's gigantic, it's about, 30, it's about a 40 metre long site. Ships were about 35 metres long. It's really unique in the fact that it's not what you usually get. So this is from around the turn of the bilge all the way up to the top rail, all the way up to your handrails. It's just nowhere else. You just don't see it on ships. You just don't see it on shipwrecks. Usually you get the bottom, first garboard strikes, and you just clean, clean cut across or something along those lines. So, oh, it's getting a bit long in the day though. <laughs> <laughs> So, one problem with this is this is the areas of recovery. So we recovered the bow castle, recovery of visible carvings, and we'll move on to those in a bit. Gun carriages, we've recovered one gun carriage and some other bits of ordnance related timbers, and some other bits, poly blocks, and a gun port lid, and then the recovery of the rudder. The rudder's gigantic. It's 9.5 meters long. I think it's about three and a half tons. And it's just, it was a monster to try and pull out, and then we had to cut it in two, sadly. Everything on the swash had to be cut down to five meters, so it would fit down into a freeze dryer. So everything, freeze dryers are annoying, are incredibly expensive, and according to Ian at York, anything over five meters, it gets really expensive, like up into the millions. <laughs> so everything's cut down into five meter chunks. The bow castle 
how the excavation was done was, firstly, this is a photo mosaic. I'm sure you're all used to this technique by now. Photo mosaic, just simple photographs taken along a grid, stitched together and made this. This is made of 2,000 images. So the excavation was done by placing a grid, made a scaffolding across, using the dredges to take off the layers and uncover the archaeology. Record all that, record the structure, and then what was happening with the recovery of the timbers, we slowly dismantled each phase, going down through ceiling planking, framing, down to the external hull features, taking a drawing at each, each level so that we could lift it, record it, and put it back together. So, what was recovered was the bow castle from there, it's gigantic. We tried to recover parts of the bow, and this is where it got a bit, the story of the squash got a bit complex at this point. So we recovered, the original plan was to recover around 200 timbers. These were placed on lifting frames on, on the seabed, all strapped down nice and lovely. The gigantic storms came in just before the lifting. And we lost about 100 timbers. And this led to a whole rejigging of the post-excavation plan. The original plan was going to be about two years worth of recording, then two years worth of analysis. And after this, we had to massively rethink the plan. So that's just a brief history. All right, so the post-excavation places, they took place intermittently from 2013 to 2016. The bulk majority of the timbers from the bow castle were lifted in 2012. The rudder was lifted in 2013 and rushed straight up to York. And the timbers themselves were rushed to Newport, Newport ship. Facilities where they're putting freshwater tanks and left there for recording purposes. Yeah. So during the excavation, a thousand artifacts were recovered. All these were sent to York Conservation, and they and various specialists have had a look at them over the years. I'm mainly going to talk to you about the post-excavation on the timbers, because that's the bit that I was doing. There was, I think it's about 13 odd specialists involved, and 13 different reports. And as you can imagine, with something this size, specialists from all over the country and all over the world, in certain cases, were contacted to get different parts of the reports, different features, and everything. So, currently, the site's buried in 300 tonnes of sand. We came to a nice arrangement with the people that are dredging at the moment outside the pool where they'll dump, they'll dump the sand on top of the site. So there's no chance of it ever uncovering. And that's a great thing because it means the security and situ protection is all covered in terrain, sandbags, and then every so often the dredges come along and dump 300 tonnes of sand on it. So there's no chance of it. Theoretically, there's no chance of it ever coming uncovered again. We do go out regularly now and monitor it just to check. And last time we went out, we actually didn't recognise the site whatsoever. So Dave, my boss, had been working on the site for 10 years and he couldn't even recognise where he was. So it's a pretty good sign that it's probably buried and won't be seen for a long time. Ugh. So, once the timbers were recovered, they all went up to Newport. Uh, it's worth mentioning that the design for the post excavation was inherited from Newport. The, all the techniques were inherited from Newport. Where we, where we differed was that they'd never been used on an underwater assemblage, and an underwater assemblage like this, that had heavy erosion and gribble and lots of other effects to the timbers themselves. And I'll show you how we kind of overcame those in the, po in the uh, analysis phases. So, we got into timbers began in 2013. It was a great thing. It took us ages, 100 timbers in total. And then, plus the other ones for the rudder, I think certain bits came up all together. So the rudder came up together and it constitutes about 56 separate pieces once you start splitting it out into its separate timbers. And each one has to be recorded individually. And it took a very long time to do that in between putting it into a freeze dryer and taking it out of a freeze dryer. Never mind turning it over, which is a very scary experience with something that big and that, well, just that rare. So, the two principal recording techniques were 3D point recording and laser scanning. So, recording, that's what 100 timbers from a battle castle look like once they're in a tank in Newport. It's a pretty nice thing. So obviously, because Newport, if you don't know the story of the Newport ship, the Newport ship was found uh, along on Newport, and then they put this gigantic post excavation recording techniques using fire arms and 3D point recording. And then we, through our contacts with Nigel Nadum, put onto Toby Jones and everyone on the Newport ship, and decided this is the perfect way to record the swash in the same, same level of detail. Obviously with the Newport ship, you also have to do all the outreach and everything else. So it's a great way of engaging, engaging people. And they've got a great, great setup up there. But so, firstly, everything has to be cleaned. And that took about a month and a half to clean every, every single timber. Take, 
you pull the timbers out with a big gantry system, pull them out, put them onto the recording tables and knock off the concretions. So, that's a very messy job. We did use volunteers during that and I think everything at this stage started, we started pulling in people. Diamond stage didn't really have people other than volunteers. With, not other than students, sorry, who were volunteers in a way but obviously with a vested interest. And then, okay, and obviously we also had to clean off a couple of shoes, if you can see that on the far, far left. There were still artifacts actually concreted onto the timbers in cases. It's a couple of shoes and then during the cleaning, obviously concretion is a great thing for preserving what's underneath it or in it. So just there, if you can see on the top left, there's a small cloth ring that was used as a washer underneath the bolts. And we managed to recover a few of those and they went up to conservation as well. And that's just a, a weird example of the blessing and a curse of concretion. Because as Kev will tell you, the concretion to get the ship apart was a pain, but the actual pres preservation underneath it was incredible. So, curse, blessing and a curse. All right, wrong way. Okay, so these are all the laser scans we collected. So these are, these constitute some of the earliest baroque carvings in the, in the planet. We use laser scans for everything because extraordinary artifacts deserve an extraordinary level recording, as I'm sure you'll agree. I'm not very text heavy with most of these slides, just to warn you. But uh, it's all visual methods, so it's all visual, visual aids, essentially. Um, so we used laser scanning for all the carvings, every single one of them. And the carvings come apart in bits, you can actually fit them all back together. They're all saved out as STLs, and you'll be able to get these from the archive when, when they're done. You can also get 3D PDFs and you can print them quite easily. I've been printing ones occasionally as presents to people from a 3D printer that I have. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see up there, this is a recording of tool marks. So obviously tool marks tend to be, tend to be got rid of during the conservation process with the peg and then the freeze drying. You occasionally lose them. So I also endeavoured to do, which was also a tangent when we realised the recording, it's not in the original recording plan. But judging, when we cleaned off the concretion, we realised how nice these tool marks are. You can see the, ad, the ads blades, you can see this thing. You can probably estimate back to the original tools and to how they were used across the site. So I decided that we'd, we better laser scan them on the planks and various other stuff to get, the, get that impression before it's lost. And that comes in later. And then various poly blocks and stuff. I believe the poly block's that good that when you print it, you can move the sheet inside it, which is just great. And then cleats. Nah, no, There we go. All right. It's a 3D point recording. 3D point recording you do with a uh, big fire arm. So it's just like a big 3D pen. And you've probably seen them in engineering works or things like that. Just a big pen and you just drag it along. So the beauty of 3D point recording, as opposed to laser scanning, 3D point recording is an interpretive technique. So it relies on the interpretation of the archaeologist who's, doing the, who's taking the recording. So unlike a laser scan, I'm sure if any have done laser scanning or even photogrammetry in this, this case, photogrammetry was in its very early stages during these phases. And it wasn't quite at the processing power where we could get, get to this. But, so laser scanning, obviously you get the whole thing without any interpretation or anything. You get fingerprints, you get marks, chisel marks, everything that was done to it and it's a mess to try and get the information you need out of it. For your point recording works with a layering system, so you'll have in a program called Rhino, it's a, basically a different version of CAD. It's a CAD-based modeling program. And the, <coughs> the original people that came up with this idea for Timbers recording was Ross Kilder. Then it was inherited for the Newport ship, and then finally to us, and then it will be used on, it's been used on multiple projects since. And it's used in, by the Dutch and Scandinavians quite a lot. Obviously, you have to develop a communication with that. There's a fraud group about firearm users and how they all use it, and they all talk. They're across many nations, and you end up talking to people about Bremhaven and stuff like that, and the Bremen Cog, and all, this, all these techniques have been used on those high-status high projects. This is quite small scale compared to those. So that's what a dismantled bow castle looks like in its entirety. As you can see, a couple of them were over six metres. Sadly, they did have to get cut down to fit in the freeze dryer. And that was particularly annoying with the handrail itself. But the way 3D point recording works, as I said, in Rhino, you get a layering system. 
Uh, each layering system has something like the original edges, damage recording. If you've ever done any timber recording, you know how to take, take that stuff, damages, film recording, tool marks. You can take it to a millimetric level. So just by taking the outline of the object, you've already beaten a paper record. And then the beauty of it is it's then a 3D model completely. It's a wireframe model that you can manipulate. You can build into a solid to print and you can do all this great stuff with it. You turn the layers on and off as well. You don't have to look. You don't have to have each individual layer on. You can take each layer off to, to look at the tool marks individually, the fasteners individually, and all this stuff. And it is an immense amount of data. So you need to have a good plan on the way in of how you're gonna get it out. Because I'd say the work we've done is probably around 30% of what's capable of the data. And that was just to achieve what we said we achieved with establishing building techniques and stuff. So, if we go into the analysis, the analysis was done in three phases. So it first started with the visual evaluation quantification, which is basically a very posh way of saying it took a hell of a lot of measurements from that data. And a lot, a lot of measurements, I think. The stats are in here somewhere. Yeah, it comes in on the next slide. So, it's brain through phase collection of the data and getting all that, the big massive data into a database so it's usable. Then we have the 3D modeling itself. So what you do is take that wireframe and then you build the sides up and stuff and create a printable solid, print the shipwreck out, put it back together, and then you've got a bow castle which is perfect. And then you can build lines from that model itself because the computer is very good in terms of aligning itself, but you can't get the curvature of a ship very well what it's trying to align it to. You can't get the actual fastener positions correct in the computer because you're talking about millimetric. It's very difficult to do that by eye. So if you print them, you can then get the curvature of the ship itself coming out in 3D prints. So, and then went from minimal reconstruction and that uses all the data from the previous phases. And then the interpretation was a complete Bowcastle reconstruction. It's looking at the building traditions, looking at the building sequences, and looking at the final report. So these, are, this, these techniques have become standard across a lot of big maritime projects now. And it's, by the sheer nature of a ship itself, you have to talk to other people. Because a ship will, of course, be traveling in between countries, you have to talk to other countries. The SWASH is the only other example well, the only other studied example, other than the Vasa, of a ship from the 1600s that managed to make it outside a port that has a forecastle. The Batavia obviously does exist now in Australia, but it's all the lower, the lower stern of it. It's not the forecastle. The only other forecastle to exist from the 1600s is the Vasa of this construction. And that makes it incredibly unique. And that's why these recording techniques were used. So the data collection itself, There's 135 timbers that we measured in total. There's 186, 1,866 measurements of fasteners. And then you can triple that because it's length, width, depth, and various other measurements to do with clinch bolts, fastener sizes, nail heads. It's a very dull activity, but the, the end product of it is worth it because you're able to quantify the actual nail heads and where they're used. So stuff like the carving tacks have different nail measurements to where the bolts are. Bolts are different in the bow, in the forecastle sections to the bow sections. And there's so much you can take from that data. Ooh, just lost that. Okay, and then we had oh, seven joint types represented and that's quite nice. The other great thing about having it dismantled is you can see the front and the back. Things like the Vasa and Mary Rose and various other things, they've never dismantled it so you don't actually know. You wouldn't ever know what's on the external planking on the inside, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't know the back side of the frame, the inside of the frame, you can't trace it in the same way. So this is where it's a fantastic thing. The 3D modeling means you can actually realign damaged edges, which is fantastic. So these two timbers broke off underwater. They weren't actually together when they were recovered, but the two cracks on them aligned to about a millimeter. And then you 3D print them and they're exactly the same. So they fit perfectly, the measurements fit with everything else. So, da, 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 da. Okay. And then make it into printable solids like this, and then we'll just go through quite quickly because I think I'm running out of time. So the interpretation analysis, Dutch ship on there's two techniques that are going on at the exact same time, Whitson and Van Eyck. Whitson's what's seen on the Vassar, 
which is you build the garboard strokes with a series of cleats and then you take the cleats off and they're replaced with small wooden plugs. And that's what the Bass is believed to be built in and various other ships. At the same time, or roughly towards the end, around 1629, you have this other technique, which is by night, which is a bit more familiar to you guys, which is the building it off frames and master frames. And we actually have the examples of the master frames in these. This is kind of basic sketch of what we have. So we're able to estimate the gun decks and various other stuff. Is this just all to demonstrate how unique the data is and how much data you can get out? Because of the way the swash was done, we only have a forecastle that's re reconstructable. But you can see the various different types of framing involved. That grey line above there is the actual line of the deck itself. Then there's a series of joints that, that line the upper deck, and there's the lower deck, and that right at the bottom on 1225, I think it is, is the cut for a gun port. So this is where you go into this as a new standard for other things. I mean, we've managed to do all the standard timber recording and analysis you usually get. The stuff you can do that is special. So these cuts, that are, these pink cuts, are during excavation. We cut them in two. We have a set time for those, a set dates, a set time for the dive logs, and then when they're put on the framing. So what you can do from that is we have a clear record of where the gribble marks are so we can say over a two year period, we're losing about 10% of the surface area just by being on the seabed. So it's kind of producing data from stuff like that that's also capable from this. This is just a standard framing, framing structure. We're able to put in a few more additionals from this new external plan just by matching traces. And then we have the richness of the data itself with the reconstructions. So. One great thing about this is you can use both at the same time. You can have, this is the original record of the rudder, and this is the reconstruction right next to it. it took about two weeks, and then, oh, oh well over, sorry. Yeah, I did go on many tangents with this stuff. Okay. And the great thing about this, the new possibilities that you have from this data, so obviously we finished all the, the, the stuff for the swash, it's all going into an archive, you'll have a printable archive of 3D data. It's all usable, it should be revisited by as many people as possible, in my opinion. So what you can do is with these four timbers were found in the dredge. They were pulled up in a dredge and given to us as, are these swash, aren't they swash? Once you stick all the measurements into the database, they line up perfectly with all the measurements in there. So it gives you the ability to then discredit things in the local area. So when stuff comes up on the beach, you can go, that's not my wreck, that probably is a new wreck, that's something else and it's giving you that data source. So if you started doing everything in this, this new technique and these new standards, you could start matching it to everything else. And it is being used all over the world. But the other thing that you can do is the, um, I've completely forgotten, but. <laughs> but Yes, yeah, so this kind of shows the growing professionalism and how we can make these data sources. The other big argument, that was it. The other big argument is to start doing this on land. Start doing this because there's more waterlog sites coming up. I've worked in London myself. More waterlog sites are starting to appear, more timbers are starting to appear. You can do this with buildings. I mean, it's not, ships obviously require such a high level of recording, but it's not necessarily has to always be ships. It could be stuff like must farm, different timbers from various other areas, and you'll be able to get a much nicer result. That's what it looks like when it's all put back together. And then these are various models of the different stuff. The archive will be completely printable, as I mentioned earlier. Utilising the data, so where we, what we did manage to do was, we've managed to breach, we breached the gap slightly between conservation and, uh, conservation and display. So obviously you, you create a project, you bring a waterlogged timber out, someone tells you it's going to be five years before you can put it in, in a museum. What we managed to do from the laser scan is CNC print out of wood. So you have to get a big wood oak, oak block, you give them the laser scan, and it pr simply prints it out. So that's how we managed to do quite a lot of things, and they can be handling collections, of course you can touch them and everything like that. So in the unveiling of the rudder, we have it next to each other. So you can touch the one that was printed, you can't touch the actual thing obviously, but you can see, and the, the laser scan is actually to 0.4 of a millimetre. So the, you'll never notice, you'll never notice the difference between the two, other than the fact that one because we couldn't afford a big block of oak that much, one split into multiple blocks of oak. Then these are what, Fairground was in the infancy during when we started. Obviously you can now do, uh, 
you can go back and redo the photogrammetry from sites like this. So obviously Photom is there to just rejig the sites, put it into the data, and you can create a photogrammetry out of it. This is an example of a bell that I scanned. We scanned up in the Isle of Wight and then printed it on the same day. So it's showing kind of what we need to use this data for now and how we really need to get out of the habit of producing data for data's sake and using it in museums and using it for stuff for display. And it needs to be thought as a product more on the way in. We go into a project knowing that what we're producing on the end can be used for display. And then we just obviously have to fund, help there. thank everyone, the Pool Museum for actually displaying it. Jenkins Marine for giving us a lot of barges and various other stuff. York Archaeology trusted all the conservation. Pool Harbour Commissioners gave us the permissions to do it. Historic England provided the majority of the money. <laughs> and this stuff doesn't come cheap. And this took a long time for us to all do. We had very many items. Ah, so I bet it's very glad that we don't plan on recovering everything else. And we're done, I think. And then Mass paid for the conservation of the carvings. And they will all be on display soon in the Pool Museum. And that's it. Sorry to <laughs> Thank you.